Hello Shaler area, welcome back to the note video series. Uh, we, in the most recent note video, uh, we finished up part one of unit one and you had your quiz. Hope everybody had a good time taking the quiz. It's always, it's always good to put those big brains of yours to the test and build up a little bit of mental sweat. But this is the sixth note video and it is the first note video in part two. So. We just finished up all of the notes on the scientific method, and now we are going to move into a little bit more of chemistry. So we're going to talk about matter and energy. Matter, by definition, is anything that has mass and takes up space. So essentially, if you can feel it, touch it, push it, hit it, roll it, you know, whatever, then it's going to be it's going to be made of matter. So, what are some properties of matter? Well, matter can be described by its physical properties, and these are essentially the things that you can sense with your senses. So, what it looks like, what it feels like, what it would taste like. Um, well, I guess maybe not taste like because there's some interesting chemistry that goes on with tasting. But if you can make an observation on this without actually changing the material into something else, then you're talking about a physical property. So physical properties are uh, these descriptions that I just mentioned. Uh, we're talking about size and weight. Density is a really, really important physical property as we learned in the, the last unit. You can identify objects by their densities temperatures, the states of matter. Do you know what the states of matter are? How many did you just list in your head? Did you just list three? Well, we're actually going to be talking about four of them in class, and there is a fifth as well. But the ones you probably were thinking of were solid, liquid, and gas. Yes, there are two more. Solubility is the word that we use when we talk about how much of something will dissolve into something else. So we um, are going to learn a little, bit, a little bit later about the terms solute and solvent. Those have to do with sol solubility. Conductivity has to do with how well the material will transfer temperature or something like electricity. So these are all properties of matter because we can measure all of these things without actually changing the material into something new. If we are measuring a piece of metal, a piece of iron, it's going to be iron when, whenever we're done measuring it. If it's a piece of wood, it's going to be wood w when we're done measuring it. If it's a balloon of oxygen gas, it's still going to be a balloon of oxygen gas. Now that's not the case when we talk about chemical properties. A chemical property is a description of any substance's ability to actually change into something new. The most common thing that you could probably think of when we're talking about chemical properties is flammability. So gasoline has the ability to burn and turn into different substances, and we can harness the energy that comes off of that. Um, iron and water will rust, and they will actually turn into a new material that we call rust. It's also called iron oxide. Um, so these are different substances. So uh, that's an example of you know, something burning. Paper burning or wood burning will turn into ash and smoke and give off some other compounds. So you probably already learned all of these, um, but it's good to refresh your memory because they're nice questions to know about, and there's almost always questions on the PSSA about things like this. When you are witnessing a chemical property, when you are witnessing a chemical change, there are very specific indicators of this. Now, just because you see one of these doesn't necessarily mean a chemical change is occurring, but... Um, if de definitely if you see a, a few of them, that's a really strong indication that something is going on chemically. Whenever you see a color change, if a solution turns from like clear to dark color, um, or from dark color to clear, or if it ch actually changes like a color of the rainbow, that is a pretty solid indication of a chemical change. The formation of something called a precipitate. Now this is an important word for you to know. The word is precipitate. And this is a fancy way to say a solid that is kind of floating around into a liquid. So um, 
if I have some kind of a solution and I put a drop of another liquid into it and suddenly the solid forms and sinks to the bottom, oftentimes it's like a white looking crystal, uh, then that means a chemical reaction has occurred. Formation of a gas, like bubbles. Now, one thing that students always like to bring up whenever I mention this one is the bubbles that form in soda when you pour it into a glass. It's actually not a chemical change. Um, that's actually carbon dioxide that's been dissolved in the soda. When you open it up, the pressure changes and all the carbon dioxide can turn into a gas um, that was dissolved into the liquid and uh, bubbles out. So there's no chemical change going on. That's still just a physical change. It's actually not even that, really, because it's still carbon dioxide gas even when it's dissolved. So it's still gas to go into gas. So. Um, an odor, this is a really, really common one. If you ever mix something together and you can smell something that you couldn't smell before, that is a really strong indication that there's a chemical change going on. And anytime there's a temperature change, if, if it gets warmer, if it gets colder, those are also really strong indications of a chemical change. So, mentioning warmer and colder, if a chemical reaction occurs and the result of the chemical reaction means that energy is given off, so let's say that there is a chemical reaction occurring and you put your hand over it and you can feel warmth coming off of the reaction. I mean, this is what happens with fire. If you have a campfire, there's a chemical reaction going on between the cellulose in the wood and the oxygen in the air and it's creating a new material but there's a flame that's the energy that's being given off uh, that kind of chemical reaction is called exothermic exo meaning outward like exit if you leave something you're exiting it there is heat exiting the chemical reaction you can feel it it's an exothermic reaction and on the flip side sometimes you'll mix things together and they'll get really cold um, First aid kits sometimes have a, a pouch of some kind that's actually two liquids that are separated from each other, but if you crack them and make, them, make the liquids uh, mix together, it gets really cold like ice. And um, this is a, there's a chemical reaction that's going on in there when this happens. And in order for the chemical reaction to take place, it requires energy. So it actually sucks energy out of the environment that are, that's around it. And it causes everything around the chemical reaction then to feel cold because it's actually having energy drawn out of it. And this is called an endothermic reaction. So if the energy is going endo, if it's going into the reaction, then it's endothermic. And endothermic reactions feel cold. Exothermic reactions feel hot. So we've got a couple quick checks. This is an interesting one. Name something that's not made of matter. This is a really interesting question, and there are a couple of things that you can say that are not made of matter. And this is another one that students often ponder about. So think about the answers to those, and we'll do a quick check question session in class. So there are two really important laws that you should know about, and they're universal, and there's oftentimes questions on the PSSA asked about them. These have been around for a really long time. One is the law of conservation of mass. It's also referred to as the law of conservation of matter. And in the law of conservation of mass, it states that matter is not created nor destroyed during any chemical or physical change. So what does that mean? Well, it means if you have a certain amount of something and a chemical reaction occurs, the amount of stuff you have when you're done is going to equal the amount of stuff that you had when you started. Um, so, it, it, in other words, if I have a one pound block of wood and I burn it and I collect all of the stuff that comes off of that chemical reaction, it would all add up to one pound. You're going to always end with the same amount of stuff that you started with because you can't actually create more atoms, nor can you destroy the atoms. There is always going to be the same number of atoms before and after. And that leads right into what we'll be doing in Unit 2. Because in Unit 2, we'll actually be writing out chemical equations, and you're going to have to balance them. So what that means is you have to make sure that you're finishing with the same number of atoms that you started with. The other law is the law of conservation of energy. So this states the same thing, but about energy. 
energy is not created nor destroyed in any chemical or physical change. One type of energy, though, can be transformed into another. So these are both pretty well tied in with uh, the whole Einstein's equals mc squared theory of relativity stuff. Um, energy and mass, you can't create them, but you can turn them from one thing into another. So there are a number of different types of energy, and this is not an exhaustive list. There's actually more types of energy than are listed here. One is kinetic energy, and kinetic energy and potential energy, I know you guys have learned before. Um, these are two that students are often very, very familiar with. So kinetic energy is, I'm sorry, um, we'll start with potential. Potential energy is energy based on position. So if I have a hill here and I put a ball on the hill and I put another ball down here and this is one and this is two which one of those two balls has more potential energy? Well you're looking at this picture and you're deciding which one has more potential energy based on the position of the balls. So it's the energy based on position. Now if we let these balls roll and they start moving down the hill, that potential energy, which is based on position, is now turns into kinetic energy because the balls are moving. And if it were to go back uphill, for example, the ball would slow down as it went up the hill, and so it would lose, lose kinetic energy, and that kinetic energy would turn back into potential energy. Chemical energy is the energy, the energy that's found in chemical bonds. So this is, you can think of this as the energy that is in that cellulose material of wood that gets released when we burn the wood. Um, so that's chemical energy that's in there. Electromagnetic energy is interesting. Um, this is one that students sometimes have a slightly difficult time wrapping their heads around because it's energy that travels as waves through space. So there are boatloads of different kinds of electromagnetic energy. Um, you just don't often necessarily think of them as this. So anything you can think of that travels through the, the air or space in the form of waves is electromagnetic. So Waves, if you want to think about what you know about waves from the Scott Avenue building, one thing that you can measure waves in is frequency. So what is it that is traveling through the air all the time and they, they are different frequencies? Well, if any of you are riding around in a car, sometimes you'll tune your radio to different frequencies and pick up different radio stations. Radio signals are a form of electromagnetic energy. You have all this energy that's traveling through the, the air as waves. We can tune into different frequencies and actually figure out what that energy is saying. Um, similarly, light is the same way. Light travels through space as a wave, and the different frequencies of the wave determine what color we see when we look with our eyes. So anything along that spectrum of light um, radio waves are actually found really far beyond the red color. Um, right past the red color is infrared. Uh, infrared is what we call heat. So in, heat energy, that's a little tricky. Infrared energy is a form of electromagnetic energy, um, and it is related to heat. But we're actually going to see heat in a couple more, more numbers. Um, X-rays are a really good form of electromagnetic energy. Gamma rays. All of those different things fall under electromagnetic energy. So electrical energy is what students often confuse the electromagnetic energy with whenever they're trying to answer questions. So electromagnetic is things traveling through space as waves, while electrical energy is actually a measurement of the movement of electrons. So when we start talking about atoms in Unit 2, this will make a little bit more sense. But when a, when a whole bunch of electrons are moving from one place to another, that is electrical energy. And the more electrons that are moving, the more current there is. And then thermal energy is where I had the little snafu a second ago. Thermal energy is what we call heat energy. 
And this is heat energy that's based on the movement of atoms. The more atoms that are moving at a faster rate, the warmer something feels. That's actually not the same thing as infrared that I mentioned before. And I didn't want, didn't want you to get the two confused. So thermal energy is the movement of heat. So I listed a few while we were talking in there, but I didn't try to give you too many because I want you to try to come up with some on your own. Some clues for this, um, think about things that you plug in in your house. So you're plugging it in to get what kind of energy and then what does the actual appliance or object do? Whatever it's doing must be using a different, a different kind of energy. So there's a, there's a clue. And that leads us to the first booby trap in part two. There are 10 questions. Good luck.